Hi, you're listening to Marsha Pally and conversations I'm having with people about the criteria we should use to design and implement our economic and political policies. What should be our basic framework for determining public policy? These conversations are based on ideas from a book of mine, Commonwealth and Covenant, Economics, Politics, and Theologies of Relationality, because we're looking specifically at relationality as this framework for policy. Relationality includes both the individual person and the relations and contexts that he or she is in. Relationality is developed in many of our philosophical traditions and also in several theological traditions. Whether you think theologies are the word of the divine or an illuminating metaphor, in both cases they offer us much about how the world and people work and so about the policies that will lead to the greatest human flourishing. Please join us in this series of conversations. Commonwealth and Covenant was published by Erdman's Press in 2016. You can follow me at marshapally.com or search for me on Facebook and Twitter. We have two things today to start. One is to talk about uh, Nicholas of Cusa as the final discussion to our concepts of uh, relationality, distinction amid, amid relation, amid situation uh, from a theological perspective. So, that's what we'll begin with. Nicholas of Cusa, who lived from 1401 to 1464, was a philosopher, a jurist, and the vicar general in the papal states. What was so interesting, interesting um, about uh, him is that in many respects he preempted modernity's divisions between mind and world, science and theology. Let's talk about mind and world first. We talked a number, for a number of weeks ago about the event or the evolution in early modernity from a picture of mind and world together in a cosmology or in a system to the early modern picture of the mind inside, metaphorically, one's head, and the world out there that mind examines, tests, and can control. Uh, a focus on the imminent frame of the world, the worldly stuff, the physical world, which ironically sounds like it's going to produce a closer relationship between person and world, but ironically produced a distancing relationship because removing the encompassing cosmology or the encompassing system, you have mind in here, world out there, rather than both in an encompassing system. So we have the irony of producing a kind of mind-world split. Which Nicholas of Cusa avoided by positing that the many ways of understanding the world through the senses, through reason, through science, through emotion, through religion, are not confined to inside your head. They're not confined to internal states, but are themselves real things in the world. Your emotions, your symbols, your language, your reason, your senses, your faith, are also real things of the world. So instead of seeing this bottle of water as an object in the world on the inside of my mind as something separate, he thought the things on the inside of your mind emerge from 
whatever everything emerges from. For Nicholas of Cusa, that was, of course, God, that everything emerges from the Creator, but that includes thoughts, emotions, and senses. You will um, already remember that this, it will sound, what I've just said, uh, like Johann Georg Hamann and his critique of Kant and his objection to Kant, um, Kant's philosophy as positing the internal categories of the mind, imposing themselves on the outside world. Um, we are stuck with whatever the internal categories can imagine, but we don't really know what's going on again out there. That was Kant's picture. Johann Georg uh, Hamann objected to it for the same very reasons very similar to Nicholas of Cusa, but Nicholas of Cusa um, foreshadowed these objections to Kant, like the ones Johann Georg Hamann had, centuries before the uh, objections to Kant and the Romantic period that also objected to Kant from the perspective of the 15th century, and I wanted to continue to review how he worked out his objections. So the first, ma ma the difference between mind and world, he avoided that distinction by seeing things in the world and things in your head as all in the same cosmology. He also subverted the science theology division that became so such a contested issue in the Enlightenment and continues in many ways today by claiming that the various ways that human beings know things are not in opposition but are complementary. It just didn't occur to him, as it occurs to some people today, that there's any problem with having multiple explanations for uh, things that you observe or encounter or experience. He felt that each way of knowing something, be it through the senses or through intuition or through scientific experimentation or through theological principle, each one is limited. And so we need to collect them all to get a better idea of what's the case. His idea was cumulative rather than divisive. He was particularly interested in the function of the imagination and belief because he felt that it prevented reason from spinning up notions that may be internally con consistent but are disconnected from, in fact, the way we live. And we've all had that experience of um, being able or reading texts that spin up a very logical presentation, which in the end is simply not the way, the way things are. It's logically internally consistent, like uh, the logic of a game, but it's not um, actually the way things are lived in life. He was hopeful that our imagination, our emotion, our beliefs work to counter this possibility of reason spinning itself into internal, uh, eternally consistent logical positions, but positions that are completely disconnected from the way we, we live. Of course, the classic example for that, for example, in the 20th century is that much of the Nazi system was internally consistent, followed the law, and made perfect sense if you were inside that system. Uh, the question being, where were the principles, the beliefs, the ethics, and even the human emotions to put a stop to that internal consistency of the Nazi program? And this is exactly what Nicholas of Cusa, while well, knowing nothing of the Nazis, um, would, uh, would expect it would happen and would expect it would be productive because all ways of knowing are important to work cumulatively together. Christian, yeah. Um, I think last week or two weeks ago we talked about legal positivism. So this is a, the thing about the Nazi law. Everything was, was an order according to the law, but this is, this is just one side. Yeah. Yeah. So legal positivism might be, uh, might be taken, certainly in extreme cases, to be an internally consistent system 
that has no basis in which to judge values or for what end are we doing it, what means are we using, what values or ethics is it responsible to, and so on, because there's nothing else outside of the system itself. This is a very bad idea, according to Nicholas of Cusa, and also a bad idea because it robs us of the multiple ways we have of knowing things. It, it depletes our resources. Why deplete your resources? Um, so, he did not see a science theology divide, but rather a cumulative uh, picture of knowledge. He echoed in this the medieval Sufi philosopher Ibn Arabi, who held that human efforts to understand the world, God's vision, and the meaning of revelation involve not only reason, but also, and I quote, the faculty of imagination and the ability to, try to strike similitudes for what transcends reason, close quote. Ibn Arabi held as well that our understanding involves what aspects of our knowledge transcend reason. Are we okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay? I want to talk a little bit more about Nicholas of Cusa's ideas of multiple ways of knowing, this cumulative idea. Um, he held that um, very interesting uh, writings on seeing and listening. He saw that everybody sees things from her or his own perspective. And you cannot see things from someone else's perspective, but you know other people have other perspectives because you hear them describe things from perspectives that you don't have. If I describe the room, I will see what I see. But if Yulia describes it, she's going to see things I don't see. So as soon as I hear her, I am aware that there are things I don't see that other people see. He held then that oculocentrism, the centrality of vision, was highly limited and needed to be combined with listening. And it's listening that teaches us that the world is constituted of multiple perspective. And this is why we have to learn, not only from our own multiple ways of knowing, but we have to learn from everybody else's multiple ways of knowing, because even if we learn from all of our own, we're still missing everybody else's. We're learning only from our own, and cannot possibly uh, know what the accumulation of listening to others will bring. So notice that Nicholas of Cusa had a profoundly relational ontology or picture of the world. Everybody's perspective is distinct. Each of us have multiple perspectives from reason, emotion, science, theology, belief, senses. But all of our perspectives are limited and we gain in understanding through our interactions with others, through our listening and our dialogue with others. In fact, Nicholas of Cusa was so concerned about oculocentrism, seeing things from only your perspective and relying only on sight as your source of information, that he rejected um, the new development of perspective painting in art. Because he felt, it's a very interesting um, position for someone in the 15th century to take, but he rejected it because, although to some it looked more realistic, right, because perspective in art works towards a vanishing point, and it, you can tell what things are, quote, closer and things are farther away. For Nicholas of Cusa, it determined the one perspective mm -hmm. from which you see things. And then actually, not only 
determined one perspective, even told, it even determines for you what that one perspective is going to be, depending on the uh, vanishing point chosen by the painter. That's fascinating because the point of art in some exactly. things is to show some things from another perspective uh, yeah, exactly. and to give you an alternate view. Um, and it might be that perspective in art itself is not a bad thing, but when it's taken as the only way, as the correct way. And that's what Nicholas Kruza was objecting to, this innovation of art, that in art painting, that set it up as the way to show things. And this, of course, was his um, primary objective. Um, the scholar Johannes Hof, in his wonderful book about Nicholas of Cusa, notes also that the perspective in art, the mono perspective in art that Cusa objected to, became a stronger and stronger tendency of the modern West echoing some of the things we've said before about early modernity by the 16th and 17th century. Um, and as Johannes Hoff puts it, that the monofocalism, you know, the one perspectiveism of painting by the 17th century became the one perspectivism, the one eye, the focus on the one eye became the focus on the one I, me, in 17th century philosophy. We, see, we discussed this, of course, in Descartes' philosophy that thought um, that one could deduce the true case of things from, again, the inside of one's head. Yeah? Um, and Johannes Hof sees a trajectory from the 15th century through the 17th and 18th century uh, of greater and greater emphasis on, quote, again, the inside of one's head and this uh, perspective from your mind onto the world. Uh, uh, as Johannes Hof said, Descartes' I, the cogito ergo sum, right? What I think, therefore I am, I think, believes that what I see is what there is to be seen. Now that's, I want to contrast it with the uh, uh, ontology and philosophy and theology of relationality that we've been talking about. Because the relationality grants you your perspective and your vision, but understands that this is a constant interaction with lots of other perspectives in the world. What Descartes thought was, if you could begin from a true first principle that you thought up, you, from the inside of your logical mind, could then deduce what was simply the case to be true. And you'll notice there's no interaction with any other points of view involved. They also preempt the problem with the skepticism that results from the Kantian, pers um, Kantian perspective or emphasis on the inside of the categories of the mind uh, by saying, no, what happens inside your mind is part of the world, part of whatever makes everything in the world exist, makes your thoughts and your words and your language exist as well. There is no bifurcation, hard line between the inside of your mind and the world. I actually, I mean, and I don't agree with the thing that um, Kant's philosophy ends up uh, in skepticism. I mean, maybe some followers after, but I mean, Kant is in, himself, I don't think he wanted actually to say that um, we cannot know if the world outside is real. I think what he meant is that we have some categories uh, and we can understand and uh, perceive and uh, know the world only through that. I mean, it means we can only know this phenomena, but not the noumena. The noumena, we cannot say anything about it because we don't have the categories, which doesn't mean, actually, that the phenomena doesn't exist. 
or that the noumena doesn't exist. I, I'm glad you raised it because it allows me to clarify a point. You're quite right that Kant didn't say the noumenal world, or real world, doesn't exist. He did say, as you say, we have no access to it. And the objection to Kant is, if you have no access to it, how do you know it's there? And from this, there is the concern about skepticism. If you have no access to something, you have no access, not through reason, not through intuition, not through emotion, not through the sense, you have no access to something, how do you know it's there? Critics of Kant said, this is an unaddressed part of his philosophy that doesn't go away. It's a problem that remains at the end of Kant's oeuvre, at the end of Kant's, Kant's uh, writings. It's a problem that doesn't go away. Um, but you're quite right. Kant didn't say the world doesn't exist or the noumena doesn't exist. His critics said, if you have no access to it, how do you know that it does? So this is a fight between the Kantians and the anti-Kantians, or the critics of Kant and Kant. And um, one more point, just, and then... Uh, Kant, Kant replied to this possibility, the charge of skepticism, by saying, no, the outside world makes sense impressions on the mind and the categories of the mind work with these sense impressions to produce whatever it is we know about the world. The critique of Kant says, if you have no access to the world, how do you know it's making sense impressions on your mind? We brought this up a couple of weeks ago, but I'm very happy to have a chance to review this. But it's a serious question, yeah? and because it is Kant's first present premise, right? Immanuel Kant begins the critique of pure reason with saying sense impressions come to the mind through the senses and our transcendental categories, our categories of our mind work with them for our understanding of the phenomenal world. And it is a serious question. If you have no access to the world, how do you know those sense impressions come from outside your categories? How do you know they come from there? How do you know they're not dreaming them up? How do you know it's not an internal movie in your own mind? Now, this doesn't end the debate. It raises a significant question. And the uh, people like Nicholas of Cusa whom we are talking about now, especially Kusa, who was before, but also people like Johann Georg Hamann, who was contemporaneous to Kant, um, were looking for ways around the problem. They didn't want to get stuck in a mind-body position or a mind-world binary. They were looking, especially Kusa and Hamann, were looking for understandings of the world which are in some ways difficult for us to understand because in the 21st century, we are the heirs we have of the mind-body problem. We have inherited the mind-body divide. And uh, in, so we have to work hard to understand a world where the mind-body divide simply doesn't come up. It just doesn't arise because the stuff of the inside of your mind is just as much stuff as stuff in the world, and all of it comes from whatever makes everything. Actually, mm, somehow, also Kant's philosophy can find a place in it, because Kant develops an ethic as well. Um, for example, what we were talking about for example, separatedness. So, um, in a kind of selfish world where everything I get is for me and everybody's doing the same, uh, and I don't care about the others. And maybe, since I don't know anything about the world, 
probably, maybe the other don't even exist. So for me, the same. Actually, Kant's philosophy end up in another direction completely, like by um, rising as well as a categorical imperative, which is very similar to the golden rule, like also in Christianity. Like, do to the others what you would like them to do to you, or don't do to them what you don't. And this is actually a form of relationality. And I think that somehow, and I know, <laughs> I finished that. Um, uh, it could help uh, more if you keep that in mind than the um, concept of co-creator that we are uh, supporting here. Um, I think it's stronger to think about um, that everybody is probably um, reasoning and feeling the same way I'm doing. So if I do something to you, it could be wrong for me if you do that to me. So I think, okay, maybe I don't. Kant's categorical imperative includes a few, it's his ethical, summary of his ethical position, it includes a few points. One is that we uh, uh, m must treat everyone as an end, not a means to an end. You can't instrumentalize people. We must act in a way that we would want everyone to act universally, right? So that we don't get away with doing something we wouldn't want others to do. And as you said, do unto others as you want others to do unto you, um, which is from the Jewish and Christian uh, traditions. So where do you think Kant got that from? I mean, <laughs> that's right, from there, <laughs> where it's coming from. Kant, uh, uh, and this is the question of how cultures work. Kant was uh, educated and grew up in a Christian Europe, which drew principles from both the Jewish and Christian traditions. And um, his, and it's not a coincidence that his secularized version of ethics shows up um, nearly identically to the both Jewish and Christian um, traditions of do unto others as you would have others do unto you. The problems that the problems that critics of Kant have, have asked is why. On Kant's scheme. Now, if you're right, if you're only relying on Kant's logic, why should you do unto others as you have to do unto you? First of all, how do you know they're acting? Second of all, how do you know what would be good for them? Because you have no access to them. And third of all, why? If you have more power and you can blast the heck out of them and get what you want, why not? He assumes that everybody has the same categories and everybody is. I mean, it, somehow I was thinking about that. No, it doesn't um, allow plurality somehow because it says, okay, um, maybe I cannot do the normal, but what I know is that everybody can feel the same, can think the same, can perceive the same. So this is at the same time, um, I mean, gives us some separability and also some situatedness. Yeah, maybe. The problem internally for Kant's system is he, you're quite right, he says that. But on Kant's system, his own philosophy doesn't substantiate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, okay, right? There's an internal right. contradiction. Right. And one of the internal contradictions in Kantian philosophy is his ethics has nothing to stand on. Because if you accept his philosophy, you can ask, how do you know people are out there? How do you know what they want because you have no access to them? And there is still no reason that you should not abuse them if you have more power. Because you cannot substantiate that others feel or reason the way you do because you have no access to them. So of course Kant said, Kant said this, uh, the, his description of reason is universal, but according to his own philosophy, he has no ways to substantiate that. Because the anti-Kantian critique 
Well, comes up, comes up in um, relational philosophy and relational theology because it's very concerned about the person locked in her or his mind with no, no access to the real world. That's a problem for epistemology, for knowledge. But it's also a problem for ethics. Mm -hmm. 